Insightful podcasts by informative hosts. Insights into Things, a podcast network. Welcome to Insights into Entertainment, a podcast series taking a deeper look into entertainment and media. Your hosts, Joseph and Michelle Whalen, a husband and wife team of pop culture fanatics, are exploring all things from music and movies to television and fandom. Welcome to Insights in Entertainment. This is episode 139, a whole new show. <laughs> I'm your host, Joseph Whalen, and my energized and revitalized co host, Michelle Whalen. Hi there. How you doing today, dear? I guess I'm okay. <laughs> So we have been talking about making a change to the show format for quite some time now. Yes, we have. Uh, I wanted to wait until we got to a more momentous number. I thought 139 was kind of rather obscure, but that's fine, I guess. Uh, That's what we're all about, being uh, obscure. obscure, Right. That's our theme, right? (laughs) Right. So when we started the podcast, it was originally meant to be a deep dive into selected entertainment news and pop culture information. That being diehard fans of a number of these key areas uh, of these topics, we thought we could lend some unique perspective on. Well, over the course of 130 episodes or so, we kind of drifted away from that into more of a reporting on current news and events with a little bit of commentary mixed in. So our hope is to get back into our original purpose, starting with this episode. We'll highlight a couple of significant events in the entertainment and pop culture worlds from a more deep dive perspective and less from a reporting perspective. Uh, And in today's episode, we're going to take a look at some interesting finds from the Disney Animation Research Library. Then we'll digest some of the feedback from the opening of the Galactic Star Cruiser experience in Disney World. That'll be our Star Wars segment. Case. Folks at home didn't know that. <laughs> just in case it's you were just, wondering. It's not meant to be two Disney stories back to back. This is a d- dedicated Disney podcast. Right. Uh, we'll also mark the 50th anniversary of one of the most iconic film franchises in movie history. Before we take a look at our experience at NerdFest this past weekend with a little bit of video footage. Before we do that, though, uh, I would invite our listening and viewing audience to subscribe to the podcast. You can find audio versions of this podcast listed as Insights in Entertainment. Video versions and audio, we're publishing both on our Insights into Things podcast now. Uh, And you can find both of those listed on Google, Apple, Spotify, Stitcher, Amazon. It's important to kind of point out the reason that we do a separate audio one is there are certain news uh, certain podcast feeds that don't do uh hybrid video and audio spotify being one of those but there's a few others so if we did just the hybrid we couldn't get listed on spotify so we have to do just an audio for gotcha that makes sense spotify we would also invite you to uh, write into us, give us your feedback, tell us what you like, what you don't like, give us your uh, conventions and shows you like us to plug. You can email us at comments at insights into things dot com. Uh, we are on Twitter at uh, at what at insights <laughs> underscore things. I'm sorry, I'm looking at a monitor that's blank on one side. And I'm trying to figure out why. Uh, we're also on Facebook at facebook.com slash insights into things podcast. We're on Instagram at instagram.com slash insights into things. Or you can find links to all those and much more on our official website at www.insightsintothings.com. Shall we get started? Sure. <laughs> So what's our first thing to talk about today? So the first thing uh, actually came from The Nerdist. And this was actually an article that was from a couple of years ago, but it was 
interesting enough to to talk about because it's um, an area of Disney that not a lot of people know about. And it's something that's actually not open to the public. But for this event that they had, they actually allowed um, some reporters in. So that was kind of how the story came to be. Um, So recently, again, well, it wasn't recently, it was back in 2017, the Disney Animation Research Library, known as the ARL, opened its doors for a group of reporters. They were going to be viewing some original art from Pinocchio during the visit. Um, it was the special 80th anniversary of Pinocchio. They were going to be re- uh, re-releasing it onto Blu-ray at the time. And so that was why they had this event. So the Disney Animation Research Library is housed in a nondescript building in the vicinity of Disney's law, uh, near Disney's Los Angeles studios. Uh, so inside its doors, it's temperature controlled vaults, um, and it's basically a treasure trove of animation history. Um, so there are things from sketches, things that are on paper things that are even written on napkins that are in this this whole archived area. And of course, like I had said, it's not accessible to the public, but they open their doors to reporters to celebrate the home release of Pinocchio. Um, So as the tour was going on, uh, in the article there, you know, you, you see all these different departments and all these different areas. Um, and they had laid out a whole area of different artwork from just Pinocchio. And what was interesting was, you know, this was original stuff. This was from like 1940, 80 year old, you know, pieces of paper. Um, and what's, you know, because, (coughs) excuse me, because of the sensitivity of it, you have to wear it, it, they don't even want you touching it, but anybody that's handling it, it's just like any other archivist uh, artifacts wearing the white gloves and and being very careful with it. And what was interesting was to see certain um, scenes that weren't in the movie, that uh, there was a whole musical number that they had wanted to do, but because of timing, they didn't add it to the movie, but they have all this original artwork for it, you know, that they've still, you know, held on to. So, um, you know, during the tour, they were talking about um, what the purpose, um, you know, was and the processes that they go through. Um, And it's, you know, obviously the, the research library, it's mostly about preservation. Their collection includes 65 million pieces in 11 different vaults. So that's from drawings, concept art, cells, backgrounds, uh, maquettes, um, and even puppets uh, from like the Nightmare Before Christmas are included. Um, they have things going all the way back to Oswald the Lucky Rabbit, and obviously even you know the the current movies as well. There's stuff there. So um, what's interesting is you know back in the day, most studios threw out items once a movie was completed, but thankfully not Walt Disney. He saved a lot of his work so that the artists, and what's interesting is they they actually started calling it the morgue, um, where all these past projects were. Uh, but the idea was that his artists would be able, if they needed inspiration or they needed to see something, they basically had their own research library to go back and look through. Now, one of the things that most Disney fans know is that back in the day, Walt actually used to give away certain pieces of art if you went to Disneyland. If, you know, Walt happened to be there on a day when you were visiting and you were walking through the park, you might actually get an original cell from a movie. So it's kind of funny how certain things were kind of given away. So is this something where uh, are there... 
are they just responsible for preserving what they have, or do they try to reclaim some of these things that got out into the public domain? Well, in the in the article, it doesn't. They don't mention anything about that. And there's actually a, a video uh, that they had done a live stream of a tour of it. So they don't talk about doing uh, trying to get anything back. But a lot of what they do is they do they are trying to digitalize a lot of it. But also what they're doing, too, is in most cases in the uh, preservation of it, they're not trying to fix anything. So if there's any sort of mistake on something, they're keeping that original mistake in it. Um, They did say if it was something where it was going to be a a re-release of something, they might go in if there was like a coffee stain or a cigarette stain or, or something that that would be the only thing that they would really kind of clean up, but everything else they wanted to leave it as is. So now you had mentioned that they don't, the public obviously doesn't have general access right. to this. Do they pull these items out to take them on tour yes. at any point? And that's one of the things that they, they talked about is that they do from time to time for special events or things you know, things will kind of be on loan that'll go out. So I was thinking when we went um, to the one anniversary mm-hmm. event, now granted that wasn't, so this is all animation stuff. So this isn't even the the live action movie, but we know that they have their own area for all of that stuff as well because the different shows that have come out on Disney Plus talk about it and and that's where you find uh you know the different collectors who have this and that and where when we went to Faniversary they had um Mary Poppins hat and that was something nobody could touch it it was only handled by one person and he was wearing the white gloves you know so that's something that's in a different vault so so to that end <clears throat> I have to assume that when this material was originally created in the 30s, 40s, and mm-hmm. 50s, yeah. it was never intended to be created with the, the idea of preserving it. Right. So do they take – Are there is there a scientific process they go through that – they treat these things differently. Like, how do they preserve that stuff that wasn't intended to be preserved? Well, and and that's the thing is, you know, I, I guess the idea – you have to figure going back – you know, so many years, he, you know, Walt was really the first person to say, hey, let's hold on to some of this stuff. This might, you know, be useful for us. So, um, sh- you know, you figure he, it was probably preserved, you know, in some way, but nothing like what they would have now. And I'm guessing, you know, they never thought, oh, we're going to digitize this or we're going to, you know. So is that one of the t- techniques <clears throat> that they use? Are they actually taking the material they have now and digitizing yes, it for public that's what, consumption? Right. And that's what they're doing with a lot of stuff just so that they can have it just as a, you know, a backup right, to right. something because obviously paper can only last you know, so long. And, and the idea is obviously they, they try not to touch certain things over and over and over again. So a lot of the stuff stays in the vaults, you know, unless it needs to come out or uh, a certain artist can request, uh, t- you know, to see certain things, so you do, know, so it's, do, it's basically a, an insider's do library. They have, did they talk anything about the process of uh, like, for instance, they're going through and creating live action uh, versions of a lot mm-hmm. of the animated films. Right. So did they happen to talk anything about how the artists are actually going back and accessing this information? No, they didn't. The new stuff? They didn't mention that. And, and I'm sure that that's probably something that that they are doing to be able to go back and, and maybe even find scenes. Again, you know, they, they talk about in Pinocchio, the one scene. <clears throat> excuse me, that they they were showing that they were, uh, you know, that they had laid out was something that pretty much nobody in the public had ever seen before. So I'm sure with some of these other animated movies, there's probably some inspiration that, you know, the, these movie makers are, are getting from looking at some of the original art. But th- it doesn't talk about that in, in this article. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna <clears> to <throat> run the, the slideshow we have of the art itself. Sure. So that we can actually take a look at some of it. Yeah, so here's some of the original art. 
Um, this was this was interesting. They mentioned um, that in the the area they have a um, this was a, a desk from one of the uh, Disney artists who has so they preserved passed. his entire work. Right, area, he had incredible. yeah. Unfortunately, he had passed away, and after he had passed away, they had moved his desk to this area. In this lobby area, there's a piano, and there's a little sign saying that the Sherman brothers and Alan oh, Menken wow, yeah. had played on this piano. So it wasn't just, you know, a piano. It, it actually meant something. So here's a vault with all of the, you know, m- rows and rows, some of the original maquettes of Pinocchio and Jiminy Cricket. You know, it's like, it, that's priceless when you, when you you know, think of, of how much... So obviously they did this because of the Pinocchio event. Mm-hmm, right. Have they opened this up in the past before? Are they planning on doing it again? In this article, it doesn't mention anything about it. It, it sounded like it was kind of a once-in-a-lifetime thing. But again, it, it's been, you know, it's been a number of years since... This article came out and, it, you know, being members, of, you know, ha- having a, a Disney Plus subscription, there's a lot of these different collectible shows that have come up and, and um, documentary type shows about the parks and about uh, the movies and about certain animation. So I have a feeling it's one of those things where, you know, maybe every now and then they'll kind of you know, let a little bit out, kind of like with, you know, Skywalker, sure. um, yeah. you know, w- with that, with Lucasfilm, you know, they don't do tours, but every now and then something comes yeah. up where they, you know, speaking open it of, up. Speaking of tours, so they, they, they're going through the process of digitizing all this stuff. Right. Have they made any kind of digital tour available or anything like that online available? Well, the only thing that was available, well, at the end of the article, there is a YouTube video. And what was interesting was it was actually when the, the tour was, was being filmed, it was actually live streamed. So Disney parks um, was live streaming this and, and, Basically, I don't know if he was the head or he's like the top curator. He was the one that was giving the tour and kind of like, hey, in this this is, you know, this department and this is this department. Um, and people could actually type their questions and he was answering live questions as it was going on. So it's kind of interesting. So they haven't done anything since then, but. To be able, you know, you can go and and watch the video now and and uh, learn about the the area. And they talk about how you know we're not open to the public, so this is a, a very rare opportunity to be able to enjoy. So I assume it's more of an archival type mm-hmm. of facility rather than a museum type yes. Of facility. Yes. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's it's really uh, uh, their their own research library, which you know. And you said this is just the animation. Portion. This is just the animation. This is how much so, resources they've got dedicated. Yeah. Just so sixty five million pieces of artwork, and like I said, I had always heard you know that Walt would hand out sell. So could you imagine all the stuff that he gave away and you figure they probably didn't save everything from the movie. They probably, you know, saved a good portion of it. And, you know, so how much would it have been if they had saved everything? And, and even when you look at, um, so I don't know, was it two years ago, I guess maybe there was the, it was a, a, a documentary that they did on Disney plus and it was, um, for frozen Two. And the whole process that they had. And again, you know, nowadays the 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 modern movies are 90 percent digital, but there's a lot of stuff that gets printed out or, or whatever. And you see them going through like their dailies and they have, you know, this pile of 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 scenes and oh, we're, we're scrapping this and they just throw it out. And now. that's the thing, like even. Even scripts, mm-hmm. you know, you, you oh, may yeah. go through multiple revisions of scripts before you get to your final script. And those edits are happening, you know, on the fly. during shooting. Right. 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 So, so even like a, a, a sheet that's thrown away from that, mm-hmm. you know, w- would certainly be yeah. worth a find. Right. So just seeing in, in that, you know, a stack of paper just. Pew, yeah. 
Yeah. Like, wow. Yeah. That's pretty so, cool. yeah, it was, yeah, it was, cool. like I said, it was an older article, but it was, again, something that most people don't know about and kind of a, an interesting peek behind the curtain, really. Very cool. Well, we'll come back and we're going to talk about uh, a Star Wars story again, uh, part of which was sourced from the Nerdist. So, good resource this week for mm-hmm. us. Yeah. We'll- For over seven years, the Second Sith Empire has been the premier community guild in the online game Star Wars The Old Republic. With hundreds of friendly and helpful active members, a weekly schedule of nightly events, annual guild meet and greets, and an active community both on the web and on Discord. The Second Sith Empire is more than your typical gaming group. We're family. Join us on the Star Forge server for nightly events such as operations, flashpoints, world boss hunts, Star Wars trivia, guild lottery, and much more. Visit us on the web today at www.thesecondsithempire.com. So the Halcyon has finally launched to much fanfare. We've talked about the rumors. We've talked about the accommodations and the activities. And most importantly, we've talked about the price. (laughs) Now people are reporting back their first actual experiences on board the fake Star Cruiser to nowhere. (laughs) And the reviews are interesting, Mm. we'll say. Uh, So it's important to note that the first few reviews are primarily from journalists who did not pay an exorbitant fee for the passage Mm -hmm, on this ridiculously expensive cruise. So we kind of have to take these reports with a bit of a grain of salt. Uh, I also have to imagine that the person providing this information was actually required to fork over the $4,000 plus for the experience. It might have a different tone to it. So they tend to be a little upbeat, but with the caveat of, hey, I didn't pay for this. Mm. If I didn't have to pay for it, I'd probably like it a lot more, too. So one of the first reviews that we digested was from noted pop culture journalist Amy Ratcliffe. And she notes quite appropriately that as a single individual on the cruise, it was impossible to experience uh, everything the Star Cruiser had to offer. And that was one of the probably more disturbing things here is that they take the same theme with the Star Cruiser that they do with everything else that, oh, well, there's too much to experience here. And uh, you'll just experience the rest the next time you come back. Mm -hmm. And it's like, um, we're not coming back again. Like, like, We mortgaged the house to get here. (laughs) So you need to give me everything at one shot because there's just not enough. There's no way we're going to be able to get back to this. Right, right. Um, The first not so insignificant feature uh, that you get is is free valley parking, which, you know, in light of Disney's more recent nickel and diming tactic of charging resort guests for parking, this is kind of a pleasant surprise, but for $4,000, you really are paying for your valley parking, aren't you? Right, exactly. So let's not let's not <clears throat> read too much into that. <laughs> right, exactly. Uh, you also get a themed magic band at check-in, mm-hmm. which is one of their big selling points here. Uh, and again, I can't consider it free since obviously that cost is incorporated into the price. Mm-hmm. Not that I'm saying take these things away and lower the price. Because they won't, but... But what was interesting was um, I saw, I happened to see, so I have a a Disney Facebook friend who just went on it. So he paid for it. He wasn't part of the the freebie. Um, And in their little pop-up, they actually, you could actually buy a... A magic band that actually was a little bit more decorative. Okay. But it was after your trip had already finished, uh, which I thought was kind of right, funny. Right, right, right. You would think, oh, well, here's the free one you the free one you get. Can I bling it up? No, you have to wait till after you've right. gotten back. So I thought that was that's, kind of that's how you had the bragging rights. Right, exactly. Look what I got. Yeah. The one thing there was so there were two articles I dug through on this. And the one thing that, that came out of both of these that was significant is you need to make sure you have your 
data pad, Mm -hmm. essentially your phone. Right. Because so much of what you do is tied to the app with your itinerary and your interactions and translations and scanning and all this stuff. The problem you run into is, is your phone going to last the entire time? Right. And that was one of the things I had read also was make sure you pack multiple battery backups. And I'm kind of surprised that they didn't come up with something for you to use that wasn't your phone. Right. Like some sort of... Right, like here, here's a loaner iPad tablet or something like that. Right, something like that, so that this way, almost so that you couldn't access the outside world. Right. Like in a way, like that. Right, to kind of isolate you to that and keep you in the Right, to keep you in the experience. Like here's something... And that it would link up to other people that you were on the cruise with. Right. So that you could kind of mix and mingle, you know, w- with others if you were going to do any of the the adventures. Sure. So there is a kind of a, they talk about a pre-show that you have when you check in. So you get valet park, you wind up going into, I guess, a spaceport type thing. Mm-hmm. And you get uh, kind of your pre-show video that, to get you into the mood. And from then on, you're on the ship. You're immersed. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I don't know. I don't know if I need that That kind of – because usually when Disney does their pre-shows, it's, it's basically to make it more palatable stand in line. So it almost makes me think, okay, all right, we're, they're bringing them in in twos and threes. We're bringing all these people in. Am I literally just standing here watching this pre-show so I can get into the next room because there's people in there right now? Mm. So it, it kind of makes me think that it's really just Disney's way of throttling the the, the passage into the building itself. Okay, I could see that. But this is supposed to kick off your story. So right. we'll give them a little bit of credit for that. Mm-hmm. I hope it's just not your typical you know, snooze fest to keep your hands and arms inside the vehicle at all times. Right, right. Um. So the rooms, okay? So it's worthwhile talking about the rooms. So the, the journalists themselves did not get to stay in the in the stateroom suites. They got to stay in the standard rooms, mm-hmm. which as a non-one percenter, we probably wouldn't be in the state rooms either. Right, right. So they talk about the fact that you get uh, – the rooms can sleep up to five. They say it will probably be cramped with five in their luggage. Mm-hmm. But you make the point of how much luggage you really bring for a two night stay, right? Because my whole point is, if we were going down and we were staying, we would probably leave all the luggage that we didn't need right. in the car. Now, granted, if you were flying down, that would be a, a little bit different. Uh, you know, I don't know if they have some place where you can leave your extra luggage. But the other thing too is, how much time are you spending? In your room, you should really only be sleeping and getting ready for the. Well, you, know. you would think, but apparently, they the room itself is part of the story itself, right? Because, because there's a you, terminal that you have there, and the terminal right. guides you where you have to go, and you, right. you get communications. True, true. But the room itself, the standard rooms come with a queen bed, two bunk beds, and then there's a pull down, mm-hmm. similar to what we ran into when we stayed at the Contemporary when we were right. down there. Just a little extra space for mm-hmm. one of the kids. Right, right. Um, you get a TV that's themed that's basically just looks like a Star Wars style screen, but it's basically a regular TV. Right. I think Disney Plus is included right, with it right. because the one person I saw was like, "Ooh, look, Cars Three, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, exists in Star Wars or something." It was <laughs> kind of oh, okay. Uh, there's no room service. So that was kind of a... Uh, that is weird because even on a cruise, on a cruise you, can get, you can still get... Yeah. So not sure why. I think maybe they were trying to keep people from spending too much time in their rooms with it. Maybe. I could see that. Um, especially because the venues for getting your food are large. They, a lot of the story revolves around them. Right. The cantina and the restaurant. So they don't want people... Sitting in the rooms, I guess, because you're not going right. To I wonder anything. if it was something where you know, at eleven o'clock at night, if you wanted something to eat, could you still I, well, and get they do. a, they've a got, snack? They've got snacks that you okay. can go and get at one okay. of the one of the areas. Do have snacks? We'll okay. talk about that later in the article. Okay. Um, you don't get windows, so once you walk into the building, the only place you can see the outside world is either on your excursion to Batu, or they have. 
an environment simulator. Yes, I did. I <laughs> and that was and it was funny because my friend who was just there, I saw that and went, oh. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> An environment simulator. A so, room with no roof. <laughs> so, another, no, it had, it was like glass oh, from well, the okay, pictures. Okay. It, it looked like, you know, you know, the area. And then it had the glass and you're like, oh, but that's not real, even though it was real. Right. You know, I'm thinking, oh, you have this, but you couldn't do a pool? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, whatever. <laughs> well, the thing that I thought was neat that they noted about it is you don't get windows, but you get... Yes. A virtual window. Yes, so you can see the stars right. outside. And what's yes. neat is the all the room windows are synced. Mm. So if the ship goes into hyperspace, they all wind up they going all, into hyperspace okay. so and everybody's, stuff like that. So it's not like this room sees this and this right. room sees it. They right. all say, okay, that's all right. The one complaint that they had was at night when you're trying to sleep, it's very bright. Mm. So you can put your shields up. Uh, <laughs> so it either turns it off or dims it down so you can okay. actually sleep. So all I right. thought that was interesting. Interesting, interesting. Um. And there's, like I said, there's an interface in the room for uh, continuing your quest. Right. On the sh with the ship's logistics droid is who you're interacting with. Okay. So. Right. So the first dining area they talk about is the Crown of Corellia dining room. Mm -hmm. This is where all the meals are taken. This is where one of the entertainment venues is. Right. Um, from both articles, they said the food was extremely good, mm -hmm. which you would expect. I mean, you're looking at it being... Um, an upscale mm -hmm. <laughs> right. restaurant on any of the other resorts. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <clears throat> Which, yeah. You know, I can never knock Disney for their quality of food. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Breakfast and lunch are served buffet style. Mm -hmm. You can get your blue milk or green milk, just like you can at uh, Galaxy's Edge. Yep. Uh, dinner is full service, but it is served family style. Okay. Interesting. So, that was kind of an interesting little take. Light snacks are available in the atrium. Oh, okay. But they say, you know, it's it's nothing to, to be impressed with. Okay, okay. So it's probably the same stuff that you would get at like a fast serve or mm, something like that. Okay. Uh, they do have grab-and-go breakfast, light snacks um, at the Sublight Lounge. Uh, they said the food's probably higher end uh, with the Star Wars themed names, but... It's down to earth stuff. Like we saw, you know, we'll show you a slideshow of some of the, the pictures. And one of the meals happens to be shrimp. It's just blue. Right. So it's, you know, it's it's nothing crazy. It's very much like what they did at uh, Galaxy's, Galaxy's Edge, Edge mm -hmm. where the food is just creatively arranged and decorated to look exotic. Right. The one thing that my, my friend had posted was a picture of... Um, it looked like a green globby thing or whatever, and it was actually peanut. Well, it wasn't peanut butter. It was sunflower seed and jelly. Okay. So a PB and J. He said it was the most delicious peanut butter and jelly sandwich he had ever had in his entire life. You know, so, but it just had this weird, you know, it almost, it didn't look moldy. It just looked like this green alien sure, thing. Yeah. So, you know, so it's amazing that they're doing all this like artistry, really. Right, right. To, you know, and and again, like you were saying, you know, for the food, um, you know, they, they'll write what it is, you know, and it's just a normal chicken, whatever, but they just put so much... Right, and sometimes mac and cheese just looks like mac and cheese. Right, but not Star Wars <laughs> mac and cheese. It's you know, so yeah, just the artistry. Right, and that again, really it's comes very in. much like what they did at Galaxy's Edge. So it yeah. helps to keep you in that environment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So no Star Wars experience is complete without a cantina scene, and that is what the Sublight Lounge is. Mm -hmm. uh, they say it's a great place to meet up with friends at the end of the day, take in a few of the odd and perhaps unsavory characters. Uh, the drinks uh, are mixed at the bar, mm -hmm. so they're not pre-made like they are. Apparently, if you go into to Uga's at Galaxy's Edge, they're all pre-mixed drinks oh, that are in there. Oh, okay, okay. These are made right there, so you can have them custom made to your oh, okay. to your liking, which is nice. Hmm. Uh, again, you know, you can get the food that's there, but the one big thing is this is where you play cards. Mm. So one of the big events that you can do is learn how to play sabak. They have Sabak tournaments. You can play in those. 
apparently from everything that I've read so far, the kids love playing this more than the adults do. Huh. So, okay. But it wasn't intended for the kids. Right. It was intended for the adults. So, you know, be careful if you go. You don't want your kid turning into a compulsive gambler when you when you get out of there playing cards. <laughs> I did also see that there was some sort of bingo that they played as as well. Right. There was you one know? that's an event that's just for the kids. Right. So it was yeah. like, you know, just like on every other cruise, there's there's bingo. Right. <laughs> so it was kind of interesting to see, you know, the Star Wars version of it. So, so Disney bills this as an immersive experience. Mm -hmm. So my I had two big questions. One, how immersive is it? And two, is it worth the cost? We'll get to the cost. Mm -hmm. But how immersive is it? So they say that once you board the Star Cruiser, you're in your favorite galaxy far, far away. At least that's how the staff treats you. And we sort of encountered this in Galaxy's Edge, too, where they don't have references to the rest of the parks. They don't have references to the mm -hmm. real world stuff. Um, but it kind of fell apart a little bit in Galaxy's Edge. Right. This is their chance to redeem that and try mm -hmm. to pull it all back together. Again. Right, right. Um, so if you come in from Earth, they treat you like you're an alien. You know, it's they recommend that you come in with an in-universe backstory mm. and immerse yourself in that backstory. As far as you know, you can dress up. You can come in from. Uh, I'm from Alderaan. Mm -hmm. well, you really can't be at this point in time because it's just rocks now. Yeah, yeah. But my a, family's originally from Alderaan. There you go. <laughs> see, but we so, moved to Tatooine. <laughs> but they encourage you that, and they try to they try to stoke that as you go okay, through. Okay. Okay. Uh, you'll get some unobtrusive history lessons while you're there from the cast members. Uh, a lot of it, a lot of it's just uh, talked about as being ad hoc, where uh, you'll run into a staff, uh, a, a cast member who's doing something, and and they'll give you a, a history lesson of something mm. on the ship. Mm -hmm. um, they faithfully remain in character, at least they did on this this press tour. So okay. again, it's one of those. I don't know how they're going to deal with real world stuff. The people in the press were kind of given instructions on on what they can and can't do and type stuff. But okay. As soon as you open that up to the the regular public, you're going to get all kinds of strange well, interactions. And, and I guess you have to kind of, if you're paying for this, no, you know, and obviously we'll get more in, into the cost. But I would think you'd want. You know, you're you're spending all that money to would, do this. But there are circumstances that that occur that they even mentioned in the articles that will get to that okay. may pull you or certainly me out of character. Mm, okay. So they talk about the fact that you know, the story flows through your phone. So mm -hmm. you got to make sure you have that with you all the time. Make sure you bring extra batteries. Um you can interact with some of the face characters through the app, but they're canned responses. It's not like they're typing text back to you or anything like that. Okay. And then when you interact with them in person, they're not going to realize. That you just message right. them or anything. So it's sort of like playing a role-playing game where they know okay. what the script is, but they don't know where in the script you are. Mm. So you may know things or have done things and they're not aware of it yet. So when you interact with them, it's kind of disjointed is how it's been described. Okay. I could see that. They also say the app is very software driven, so there's lots of bugs in it. So mm. they're still working a lot of well, bugs Well, you out. figure it's only been a couple of weeks, so. The, the couple of biggest problems, you get repeated messages, the same messages over and over, and you get messages out of sequence, mm. which from a story standpoint, that could be jarring <clears throat> to okay. understand. You know, you got a message that you shouldn't have gotten for three messages in and, and you know, okay. spoilers, confusion, and so forth. Okay. The itinerary, uh, the immersion is very itinerary driven, uh, but they say itinerary changes based on the missions you pick up. So when you get there, there's a couple of missions you just get by default. Okay. But there's a whole ton of side missions that you can do depending on who you interact with and what you scan and, and all that stuff. So, the v advantage that they say here is that, well, the next time you come back, you can have a completely different experience. For four grand, I'd expect a completely different experience <laughs> when I come back. I, you know, I mean, you're not giving me something that's that's a selling point. Right. They they really should be marketing this as this is a once in a lifetime thing. You might never come right. back. Right. Um, 
from all accounts, it seems like some of the story is kind of forced down your throat. Mm. And we'll talk about that later when you get to to Galaxy's Edge and how the missions continue there, and mm -hmm. you might not even be aware of it. None of the things that you do impact the outcome of the voyage or your trip or anything. So you make all these choices, you feel like you're involved, and the same thing happens at the end of the day no matter what. Okay. So to me, when it comes to an MMO online game and I'm playing through that story and my choices don't matter, it's very frustrating for me. Okay, I could see why that. why do I make these choices right. in the first place? Right, Um, So... The one they they one thing they do tell you is that the crew is trying to accommodate so many guests at once. So each of those guests are at a different stage in their story. So you may go to a cast member to try to interact with them to advance a quest, and they may be interacting with someone else who's earlier in that quest, further in that quest, on a different quest, and you have to wait your turn to interact with them. Mm. They say sit there and listen because what they tell them might be relevant right. to what you say. Okay. But this is where I could see people getting frustrated quickly because you're trying to run, th you're trying to do everything at once. Mm. And if I have to sit here and wait for five people to talk to this guy before I can get to him, I could have gone and done something exactly. else. Exactly. Yeah. I got two days here mm -hmm. and I'm wasting my time trying to talk right. to someone to advance. This is where I would get frustrated and come out of character at that mm. point in time. So right. Okay. That's what I'm saying. There's situations where. Even a diehard like me who can go in there and be in character will get frustrated. Mm. And you kind of have to have patience with these things. Right. They, right. they kind of target that towards the kids more than the adults. But the adults are the ones that are paying for this. So the adults are the True. ones that are going to want to be well, satisfied. And I, and I guess it, it really also depends on your level of fandom, too. Absolutely. Are you just doing you know, this to just. If you're not a fan, you're not going with this, I don't think. I, who's going to spend four thousand dollars? Your daughter, she hates Harry Potter. She would never spend four thousand dollars to go to Universal Studios and go to Harry Potter. She just wouldn't, right? No matter how cool it is, right? So you got to be a fan at, at some level to do this, right? But again, you know, going back to my friend who was just there, people asked, "Oh, did you do a lot of the quests?" No, not really. He was really going just, just to kind of, yeah, yeah, like for, you know, and he doesn't have. Well, and that's what I would do. I would right. go for the immersion <clears throat> and a nice leisurely walk through one or two of the stories. And that's right. It. I right. don't, I don't want to go there and it'd be a job to have to do everything. At right. Once. That's right. not what I want. And I'm sure for the kids, it's more so, you know, I got to do this quest and I, you know, I want to do all the quests where the parents are probably, so what drink are we trying today right. in the lounge? Absolutely. <laughs> So how about a Rena shuttle? Okay. <laughs> so everyone's heard there's an excursion to Batu, right. which is Galaxy's Edge at Hollywood Studios. Right. This is accomplished via a box truck. Yep. No, really. Yeah. It, it's a box truck. Yep. But it looks really cool on the inside. You never <laughs> see the exterior, so you don't know you're in a box truck. Right. But they decorate up the inside, and that's how they transport you the yep. short distance over to the thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, I thought that was interesting. Mm -hmm. So you do get uh, lightning lane access to the Millennium Falcon Smuggler's Run and Rise of the Resistance, which, again, very generous for Disney to do that. <laughs> However, part of your mission on the ship are tied to these rides. Mm, okay. It was unclear how obvious they made that aware to the people. Okay. Because just by going on, a ri on the rides... You accomplish though you complete those missions. Okay. One happens to be stealing coaxium or smuggling coaxium for someone or something like that. But you don't need to know that because they try to integrate it into the story ride itself. Mm. But the story ride itself is the same story ride as when it launched, which had nothing to do with the Halcyon. Right, right. So it's kind of quirky how they kind of mm. tie okay. that in. They also say that you can stop by Uga's, but you don't get a reservation automatically. It's not included. And they do tell you to let someone from the cruise know that you're there. Because I don't – and it was unclear why. It's almost like they try to keep you on a very strict regiment while you're there, and, and Uga's is not included in that. Well, I'm guessing because you're only there for so long a period of time – and they probably don't want you wandering off to other areas 
of the park right. because you have to get back to your shuttle to get back to the ship by a certain time. Right, so right. I'm guessing maybe that's you know, because I'm I'm guessing probably most people go go on their two rides, maybe walk around a little bit and then head back to the ship because there's other things Right, because you're paying to be on the ship. You're not paying to be at Galaxy's End. Right, right. Um, but you, the last last shuttle back to the ship is four o'clock. So mm. they take you in shifts there, mm -hmm. and then you can come back as you need to. Right. So if you're one of the earlier ones there. You literally can spend the whole day there if you right. want to. Right. Right. Whether or not you do or not, right, is up to you. So how about the activities? Every cruise can't be isn't complete without activities. Mm -hmm. So there's a few activities that show up on your schedule automatically. Uh, these you don't have much control over. It's like orientation, bridge orientation, mm -hmm. lightsaber training, stuff like that. I'm not sure I like them just sticking stuff on my itinerary and making me do them. Uh, that's fine, you know. Uh, some of the activities um, were kind of lackluster. They mm. talked about the bridge training where they sit you down and you do something at a console itself. They said it was very similar to, to flying the Falcon. You had one thing, push this button over and over, or lift this lever or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. So you weren't really doing anything, nor did it have any real effect on the ship itself. So it was a very isolated experience. Okay. Other things that they talk about. Don't show up on your itinerary, and that's through interactions with different people around the ship, different cast members and stuff like that. So they said there was a lot of opportunities to interact with other people and get story that way and mm -hmm. so forth. So as much as Dizzy tries to tie you down to the itinerary, you don't have to follow that if you don't want to, if you really want to immerse yourself. Mm -hmm. And then there's the story. So it's a very specific, very static story that they do. Everyone experiences the same story. Um, it's set, it's sandwiched between Last Jedi and, and Rise of Skywalker. So it's Disney Star Wars. It's not my Star Wars. Right. Which is the biggest drawback of Galaxy's Edge entirely. Mm -hmm. uh, they said the story arcs resemble what Disney had originally intended for Galaxy's Edge, but it never, they never really fully realized it because it was, there was too many people. Right. You could not cater that kind of personalized story to everyone. Okay. The the Star Cruiser is really their second chance to do that. And and by all accounts, they're doing a much better job of it here, but it's costing you. Mm hmm Right. There were they couldn't be more complimentary for the performers, whether it's the cast members you interact with, the actual performers at the dinner show. They said they were fantastic. It, that alone was worth going just, just because mm -hmm. of the professionalism of their. Okay. Um, the one complaint that they had from a story standpoint is for being a Star Wars galaxy far, far away, apparently there's an overall lack of two things you'd expect in that universe. Droids and aliens. Hmm. So they, there was like one astromech droid that was going around the ship, and that was okay. it couple of people that were done up as aliens, not very many at all, but they were lead characters. So you didn't, okay. you weren't bumping into people in the hallway and mm. stuff like that. So they said that kind of killed the effect of it being in, a, okay. in an alien world. Okay. Um, and of course, no Disney experience is complete without a gift shop, mm -hmm. right? Yep. So there's two chances <clears throat> that Disney can wring a little bit more money out of yep. you on this one. <laughs> so you have the Chandrilla Collection, which is a small shop on board. That's targeted more for um, buying things to fit in. Yes, they clothing were clothing and 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 stuff like that. And some that. collectibles of because again, my friend had posted the the photo. So again, non branded collectibles. Non branded collectible like there was some glassware, right. um, jewelry, yep. clothing thing. You know, things that you would expect at a high end boutique. Right. That was what... Now, you can buy the more tchotchke-style stuff on your excursion to... Batu. Batu. There's a pop-up shop that's mm -hmm. in the little kiosk area that you uh, board the shuttle and get off the shuttle. The, right. The rent, the U-Haul. Um, and you could buy Star Cruiser-specific stuff there and some of the bragging rights stuff there. Mm -hmm. But they don't, they don't 
overwhelm you, which is what really right. kind of blew me away. Right. And then finally, we come down to the price. So is the $4,809 for the standard room worth it? One person who attended on a complimentary pass doesn't think so. And they were there for free, mm. mind you. Okay? Right, right. Uh, after seeing what I've seen and reading what I've read, I have to agree. Disney's non-existent cruise to nowhere at an astronomical price is a big ask, uh, but it's also in line with what seems to be their new target audience of one percenters that Disney appears to be aiming for. So short of hitting the lottery or getting a complimentary trip myself, uh, I'll be avoiding this particular Disney money trap. So... I don't know. What do you think? You think it's it's worth it as a once in a lifetime? You know, you turn fifty, we're gonna go on a. That'll be our Disney cruise. I don't think that's the. Uh, yeah, the I I think if I had my my choice of two days doing that or going to Disneyland Paris for the same amount of money, I I would choose Disneyland Paris. Yeah. You know, I as much of knowing how much of a Star Wars family we are, I just I for half the price. See, you know, not only can I not justify paying that money for that limited an experience, mm-hmm. I refuse to support what really is Disney slap in the face to every Star Wars fan mm-hmm. out there. Right. Because your average Star Wars fan is not going to be able to afford this. Right. And you're deliberately pricing out that entire mm-hmm. fan base. Right. And I think that that's <coughs> that's the biggest thing. If if you slash that price, and that was even when we were still DVC members, there was the option of, okay, how how much yeah. of points do we and and for the amount of points that we were gonna have to use versus taking a, a seven day cruise, it was just it didn't. It didn't equal. It, it. 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 There was no comparison to to either or. So I would rather spend five thousand dollars and go to Paris than just stay. <laughs> to, you know, like it would be nice if you could just do like a a, a one day walkthrough of it or, or something. You know, for you know two hundred dollars. <coughs> For two hundred dollars, you get to you know spend the day on the ship. Yeah, I well, could you know, see that, that. That would be interesting. You know, with maybe you know you get one meal. You know, I'll even say three hundred. But see, you know? and that's the thing: you can get the the environmental experience at Galaxy's Edge that you right. get here. They don't have some of the lightsaber training. Well, or that's what that I was stuff. saying. So to... you bring that stuff out so the general public can have some right. access to that right. stuff too. Right. So I, I don't know. It's it's to me it's not worth it. Anyway, we'll be back. Uh, we're we're pushing up on the clock here, so we'll we'll do a, a quick uh, review of our next story when sure. we come back. Sure. Insights into Teens, a podcast series exploring the issues and challenges of today's youth. Talking to real teens about real teen problems. Explore issues from braces to puberty, social anxiety to financial responsibility. Each week, we talk about the topics concerning today's youth. We look at how the issues affect teens, how to cope with these issues, and how parents, friends, and loved ones can help teens handle these challenges. Check out our video episodes on youtube.com backslash insights into things. Catch our audio versions on podcast.insightsintoteens.com or on the web at insightsintothings.com. So it's been described as the gone with the wind of gangster movies. It was cutting edge when it was originally released and still to this day stands the test of time. The movie that made us an offer we couldn't refuse, The Godfather, has turned 50. 
Uh, it's also returning in limited uh, theaters to mark its epic anniversary, and many of the stars of the movies have shared their thoughts on its legacy. What are your thoughts on on The Godfather? When did you see it? How old were you when you saw it? Oh, gosh. I, hmm. uh, well, I was probably too young when I, I first saw it, um, but then probably didn't see it again until probably high school. That's when um, I saw I saw it in high school. And because and when I was in high school that was actually when Godfather 3 came out and I remember in our one English class we you know we had been talking about it so there were a couple of us that actually went to go see the third one because we were talking about the impact of the first one and and really when you think about it it, it was kind of the the start of you know, there had been gangster movies all, you know, throughout, you know, cinema. Mm-hmm. Um, but really, that was kind of the one that led the way for, you know, some of the the more modern gangster movies. Like, you know, they kind of look at, at that and, and kind of go from there. Well, it's funny you mention that because in a recent interview, Talia Shire described... Her brother, Francis Ford Coppola, Mm -hmm. characterizing the movie as a waltz. Mm. Uh, She says the endless cycle of the family had a sense of a waltz to it. And it's hard to argue with that. It really did have that. And I think that's really what scared the studios more than anything because it was so different than the gangster movies you had up to that point. Right. Um, Everything was family, really. It was all about taking care of the family. It was a huge... Mm -hmm gamble for paramount and by most accounts the movie was held to shoot for coppola they said there mm-hmm. were reports of a running battle between uh coppola and the, his bosses at paramount and even the crew at times because of creative dif- mm. differences uh casting decisions you know they brought uh marlon brando in who at that point in time was kind of obscure at that point in right. his career nobody wanted to touch him at that point right and it kind of reinvigorated his career. Yeah, yeah. Um, they said that he Coppola was in constant fear of getting sacked by Paramount during this whole thing. Hmm. Even in post-production, when he made his choice of Italian maestro Nino Rota, uh, that was questioned. Coppola bluffed by threatening to have his name removed from the movie before Paramount finally gave in to his decision. Wow. So there was this constant strife <clears throat> that he was running into with this movie. And in the in the interview with Talia Shire, she says, I wouldn't have had me on the set. She said the last thing he needed was his sister at the yeah, time. Yeah, true. You know, I had a one more tension for him. Yeah, exactly. Uh, Thinking about you, that. If you think back to the movie where there's the scene where she and her new husband are fighting and she's pregnant in the scene, she says, it's a rough thing to see a pregnant woman being knocked around. Right. She says, I had to move from place to place and it was honestly, I was terrified because you didn't want to do another take because another take meant everything had to be reset. She says, I just want to keep going Mm. Um, because it it would have cost money to do the resets and reshoots and all that stuff. So, yeah, even when it was being made, it was such a different movie. Well, even the novel itself, the novel was written in the the 60s and – and was a huge hit, which is mm-hmm. why it spawned the movie. Right, right. But it was so different than like the Cagney style gangster movies right. that you were used to. Right. And I think a lot of it had to do with the fact that it was very reflective of of our country mm. at that time. Yeah. You know, the the power struggles, the politics, the you know, do whatever it is you need to do. Um and it came out in some of the uh some of the quotes, you know, mm-hmm. you got some of the best one line. I, I wrote a couple of these down. Yeah. You know, there's one line uh, where Michael Corleone says, don't ask me my biz. Don't, don't, don't ask me about my business, Kay. You know, even before Fight Club, which, mm-hmm. you know, we don't talk about that either. Right, but, right. You know, it set the precedent on how mm-hmm. you handle things that people don't want to know the truth about. Right. You may ask about it, but don't ask me about it. Uh, you know, take the gun, leave, leave the, the cannoli. cannoli. <laughs> Some might say these are words live by. For me, it's the first line out of my mouth whenever I walk into a bakery. Yep, it is. <laughs> um, and then you have the really personal lines, like I know it was you, Frito. Frito, you broke my heart. Mm-hmm. Yep. You know, if you're, <clears throat> you know, if you're looking for the most poetically perfect way to tell your brother you know his secret, you couldn't ask for a better line. Yeah. Yeah. 
Uh, revenge is a dish best served cold. Mm -hmm. now, while it's attributed as an old Klingon proverb, <laughs> the Klingons probably got it from this movie. Yeah. <laughs> and the one that I think really kind of speaks to why the movie had such an impact was very early on in the movie, Don Culeone says, I believe in America. Mm -hmm. And he does. Right. But it's his version of America. Right. You know, and in our current state of political upheaval, this line's incredibly poignant mm -hmm. and tells us that America is what you make of it. If mm. your America is gun to your head, going to take your money, if you don't do what <laughs> I say, make demands, then that's your America. Mm -hmm. That's not everybody else's America. So it's that distorted, that ability to distort things in such a way. To, that, to be how you want it to right, be. To make yourself feel good about yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. And then... You know, the most famous line from the whole movie, and yes, this line is so well delivered and so perfect in the movie that it appears twice in our breakdown here. 50 years later, people dream of a chance to use the line any chance they get, and that is, I'm going to make him an offer he can't refuse. And that's like, everyone knows where that line comes mm -hmm. from. They yeah. know who said it, and it's it's fantastic. But culturally, though, I mean, we talk about the, the careers and the impact and, and stuff like that. It was a self-reflective look at the, the country during some of our most formative years mm -hmm. that the movie portrays. Um, and it's a shining example of how certain aspects of the population exploited their opportunities. Mm -hmm. They bent, broke, bought, and rewrote the rules of the land to their favor. And it still happens to this day. Whether it's happening in business or politics or crime or whatever, what Don Corleone represented in the movie is what so many people aspire to. That power, that ultimate power, that ability to manipulate things and be in control. Mm -hmm. And so many fortunes in today's businesses have been made on that. It's not biographical. It's not historical. But there are grains of truth in the film that make us question reality and kind of look at the world differently. Uh, and we've never gone back to the way it was before Godfather. That kind of opened our eyes to a reality that a lot of people didn't want to ask about, I think. And I think what's also interesting is it's it's probably one of the top movies of all time. And Godfather 2 is revered also as one of the best movies that, you know, normally sequels... You know, after you do the first one, they kind of go downhill from that. Yeah. But, you know, Godfather 2 kind of stands alone, you know, on, on its own as being a, a really great movie. And it's interesting because it takes you, it's a prequel to the Godfather. Right, so right. you kind of see everything. And that, that concept itself <clears throat> was interesting at the time because right. you didn't have that sort of mm -hmm. thing. Right. Um, where it's like, okay, we drew the line in the sand. Now let's go back and show you how we got to that line. Right. Where normally you never did that. You always went forward. Right. So it was an interesting, you know, take on it. And it was so well received on top of the success of the original. Absolutely. And I have little doubt the Godfather will still be relevant 50 years from now, too. Yep. So we're going to take a quick break. We'll come back and we'll get some of our afterthoughts to cover. Sure. So what do we have for our afterthoughts? So going on, fortunately, if you're watching us live... <laughs> Uh, and not on, you know, after the fact, ZoloCon is going on this weekend. Um, it's going until six o'clock. So if you're in the area, you got until six to today. Um, tomorrow, it'll be from nine to four thirty. We're actually planning to to be there uh, tomorrow for it. Uh, that's in Warminster, Pennsylvania. Uh, then in a couple of weeks after that, we have the Delaware Train Show and the April Fool's Toy Show. Uh, that would be April 2nd and April 3rd. And that is in Newcastle, Delaware at the Nurshrine Center. And before we go, we did attend our uh, Nerd Fest mm -hmm. this weekend here. We're going to run some footage of that real quick yep. to kind of describe. It was a typical local mm -hmm. uh, pop culture event here. Right. A lot of local artists were there. I was kind of surprised at how many artists that they had there. Yeah, it was it was it was a pleasant surprise to to see how many local artists were there, local vendors were there. Um, a nice mix 
uh, of different types of, of artists. You had a lot of people selling um, handmade things, yep. which was nice to see, along with uh, your, your different vendors obviously selling your pops. Not as many collectibles... Yeah, a lot of it was much more handmade. Right, it was much more right, which was kind of cool because you know better to have that. Obviously, we had the five hundred first was there. Um, then uh, the, the local Ghostbusters were there as well. Um, a couple of cosplayers, not too many of them uh, there, and and uh, some local uh, authors. Uh, with their books, they had a face painter, um, you know, as well. Uh, different clothing uh, makers uh, were there with uh, different types of T-shirts or sweatshirts and things. And we had the the one artist that was there who was the taxidermist artist yes. that we talked to. Why don't you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, so that was kind of interesting. I almost came home with a bat. <laughs> A real bat that a was real taxidermied. A bat that was taxidermied in, in this cute little cage. So we were talking uh, to him, and, and you had asked him how he came yeah, to... how he sourced his, <laughs> how he his, sourced his, his critters. And what was it? So he kind of had a... So he said he has a license. He's a licensed scavenger. Right. Which I didn't even know that existed. But he said most of the stuff that he gets comes from people that he works with. Right, they kind of trade they'll, things. Right, so he'll they'll send him the, for lack of a better word, carcasses. Right. He'll taxidermy them. His, was it his son or his nephew? Nephew, his, his nephew. His nephew does the actual settings and the, right, and the, the dioramas. dioramas and stuff like right, that. Right, right. And he'll set the... Uh, the taxidermic animals in here, and he'll send some of these back to these people that, that provide the right, materials for right. it. And it's really cool. They did... Not only did they do the bats in the cages, they did these incredibly ornate ostrich eggs. Yes. Uh, because the the person who runs it is a former dentist. He uses dental tools to actually go in there and carve these out. Talking about no additional material added to it. He mm -hmm. just takes the egg, carves it out, and you had three-dimensional renderings of, of a dragon. dragons coming out. Yeah. I mean, it was incredible yeah. the kind of detail the guy had. Yeah. Uh, first time I think we'd seen that vendor. Mm -hmm. And he's a local guy, too, which is nice. Right, right. So he actually is going to be at some of the other local... Uh, he'll be at Monster Mania, which is coming up in a couple of yeah. months. And then another one that's up in Parsippany, Monster Con, I right, think it was. Right, the next horror one up there. Yeah, so... so yeah. It was interesting. It was, <clears throat> it was a... It was a Kind of a cool venue the way they mm -hmm. laid it out. It was small. Right. It wasn't very big. But you had a lot of vendors for such a small mm -hmm. area. But it was laid out in such a way that you didn't feel claustrophobic in there, which right, was Right, nice. because they had the one banquet room set up with the doors open. But then they had guests. They had vendors throughout the, the, lobby, the lobby area as the well. So, lobby, yeah. So. Uh, it was it was cool. I certainly you know for the price, it, it you can't beat you know five bucks to get in there yeah. and look around and stuff. So it's probably one that we'll we'll end mm -hmm. up going to again. Yeah, absolutely. So that was that was Nerd Fest last mm -hmm. weekend. Yeah, and I think that was all we had. Before we do go though, I do want to uh, invite you to subscribe to the podcast. You can find audio versions listed as insights into entertainment. You can also find video and audio versions listed under insights into things. We're available on Pandora, Castro, Stitcher, Podbean, Buzzsprout, and so forth. I uh, would also invite you to write in to us. Give us your feedback. Tell us how the new format of the show works. We were, we're curious if, if this works better than what we were doing before. You can email us at comments at insightsintothings.com. You can find us on Twitter at uh, twitter.com in backslash insights into things. You can find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash insights into things podcast. You can find us on Instagram uh, at instagram.com backslash insights into things. And you can find all that and more on our official website at insights into things.com. That's it. Another one in the books. Have a good week, everyone. Bye. Bye. Thank you.